Today, we will be talking about time-dependent forces. This topic involves calculus, which is why it hasn't been included in our AP Physics 1 series. The idea behind time-dependent forces is that they are dependent on time, which just means that if time changes, our force is also going to change. And now, um, that just means our force is probably not going to be constant, and we need to account for this when we do our, our equations. Now, an example of a time-dependent force is the brake, or the when you uh, put, uh, use the brakes on your car. Because when you use your brakes, you don't push all of the force all at once uh, to brake your car. You usually start slowly applying force on the pedal into, and then increasing the force as you slow down. Now, this change in acceleration, er, we also need to know that a change in acceleration means a change in force. This is just because from F equals MA, we have our literal relationship. As A changes, F also changes. If A goes up, F goes up. If A goes down, F goes down. Now, for changing acceleration, um, what we want to do is find an equation to find um, uh, our velocity after um, a certain amount of time um, given some force. So the way we do this is we note that acceleration is just dv by dt, where v is velocity. But we also know acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. And that's just um, dividing both sides of our for Newton's second law, which is F equals M times A. Now, using our second to uh, dV by dt equals F uh, over, or F of t over M, we ha integrate both sides with respect to t. And on the left, we do an integration from V naught to V because we, we want to see what happens um, as our velocity changes on that side. Um, so there, um, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, since our, we're taking the integral of the derivative, we know that it's just going to be the function that we were taking the derivative of um, evaluated at v0 and v in this case. So um, our left side is simplified to v0 or v minus v0. And then on the right side of our equation, we see our integral from 0 to t of f of t over m dt. Now, when going onwards, there's not much we can do here because we don't know what f of t is, but that's fine for now. We just move m out and we end up with 1 over m times the same integral, or the integral of force from 0 to t dt. Now, then we just add v0 to both sides. Now, this is a really good equation to know because now um, we can say, well, Given our changing force, I can find out over time um, what the final velocity is, given also the initial velocity and the mass of the object you're looking at, which is really good. And then just to show that, th because th this formula isn't very good if um, when f is constant, it doesn't reduce down to something we already know. If f is constant, then we know a is constant. So ideally, we want to have a kinematic equation. So plugging in f of t with just f, where f is now just a number, um, we have our integral of a constant, which is just, um, in this case, f times t. Um, and since it's from 0 to t, we know that it's just f, ti f times t minus f times 0, but f times 0 is just 0. So we have v0 plus f over m times t. Now, remembering that f over m is just a because of the um, Newton's first law or second law of motion, we have v equals v naught plus a t, which is our kinematic equation um, for one given time and acceleration and velocity, which is really good because we now know that okay, if our acceleration is changing. This equation doesn't work, but this slightly more complicated equation does work right here, which is good because we've just created a generalization. Now, 
looking at changing acceleration um, a bit more, we notice, or we, we're going to see if we can find another kinematic equation for ki changing acceleration when we have, uh, but with position. So we start off with dx by dt equals v of t. Our derivative of position is just uh, is just velocity. Taking the derivative of both sides, or the integral of both sides, tells um, on the left we do our integral from x naught to x because we want to see how x is changing over time because we're looking at how x changes over time. And on the right we have zero to t because we want to... Um, there we want to see what v is doing just like you know it's just sort of we just want to see what v is doing between the time it starts and the time it ends um so on the left we use our fundamental theorem of calculus um and we see the integral of a derivative is just the function evaluated at is at its bound. So we have x minus x naught equals, and then we can't really do anything with our, or well, we choose not to do anything with the left side of our equation, or the right side of our equation. And then we just add x naught to both sides, and we have this formula. But th this formula, um, w we, we want to go a little bit further. We know v of t from the last equation is just v naught plus 1 over m times the integral of 0 to t of f of t dt. So why don't we plug that in? So this is our equation for um, x for a changing force. And to be honest, it looks quite ugly. And I think most people will agree there. But what we're going to do next is really cool. We're going to then say, because we want this to somehow reduce to uh, an equation that has x and uh, um, that tells us x in terms of t, because we're integrating with, with respect to t, so we better have um, x in terms of t in our last equation. Now, so let's assume that f of t is constant, just to see where it gets us. Then we have f x equals x naught time or plus the integral from zero to t of v naught plus a t with respect to t. Now that is because we know this when f is f of t is constant from the last one that that's just v naught plus a t. And now just integrating that we have um, v naught times t for our first term, um, and then of course it's v naught times zero or we're subtracting, we do v naught times t minus v naught times 0, which is just v naught, and then we have um, 1 half a t squared um, evaluated um, at t and 0, which just gives us 1 half a t squared, and now now that we know that's v naught t plus one half a t squared, we see that after integration we just get x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, which is exactly what we want because we once again we made a generalization. We say, well, we know that acceleration isn't always going to be constant. So what happens when acceler to uh, movement when acceleration isn't constant? And this is exactly what we get. This ugly equation that turns out to work out quite nicely when f of t is constant, which is exactly what we want, because that's what we want out of kinematics, a more ideal situation with easier equations to deal with. Now, we'll, we'll take an example. Uh, this example is a car of mass m equals 1,260 kilograms is moving at a velocity of 105 kilometers per hour, which is also about 65 miles an hour, or 29.2 meters per sec. Now, the driver begins to apply brakes so that the magnitude of the braking force increases linear, linearly with time at a rate of 3,360 newtons per second. How much time passes uh, our first question is how much time passes before the car comes to rest and how far the car, does the car travel in the process? Now, 
this um, this is going to just come straight from our equations. It's just some plugging and doing some integration. But that isn't always easy. So um, we'll give you five seconds to pause the video and try it for yourself. But don't be upset if you can't do it. Because it's not easy doing this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. Now that you've hopefully tried out the problem, um, I'm going to reveal a solution. And this is for part A. If we have, um, if we let our car have a velocity uh, pointing in the positive x direction, then we can let our braking force be f of t equals negative c times t, where c is just 3,360 newtons per second. This negative sign is just there because we want to show that the force is going in the opposite direction as our current velocity, which is just saying we want our force to ta be taking away from our velocity rather than adding to our velocity. Now, using our, our, first, er, our first equation, we have v naught of t, uh, v of t equals v naught plus one, over, uh, or plus 1 over m times the integral from 0 to t of negative ct dt. And now integrating, um, integrating this, we have 1 half ct squared. And since um, we're, it's from 0 to t, we just have a negative 1 half ct squared because um, of that evaluated at 0 is just 0. Um, and then we divide by m, right, because we have that there. So our velocity, or our v of t, um, so velocity at some given point in time is just v naught minus ct squared over 2m. And now, to find the time when the car comes to a stop, we'll call it t1, we're going to need to set the expression for v of t equal to 0, and then solve for t. And now doing that, um, we get um, this equation, t equals the square root of 2v naught m divided by c. And now, hopefully at this point, you've done your, you know enough algebra to be able to do that on your own. And that shouldn't be too confusing for you to see. Um, and then we just plug in our values, making sure that we use our that 29.2 meters per second, um, since newtons is given um, in me kilogram meters per second, and we also have newtons per second on the bottom. Uh, so we want everything to cancel out nicely. And plugging our stuff in, we get 4.68 seconds. And now... Um, we're going to go to the next part B. Now, to find out how far the car goes during our time of 4.68 uh, seconds, uh, we need an expression for x of t, right? Because we can't, we, we need some way of finding x of t. So, what we do here is we're going to take x of t plus x naught plus the integral of 0 to t of v of t dt. Now we're not using the ugly equation, we're using the nicer equation back when it was just v of t rather than plugging in the first equation. So we just have our integral v naught minus ct squared over 2m from 0 to t. Now evaluating this uh, integral v naught times t for, is our first term. Um, and then, of course, you'd subtract v naught times 0, but that's just 0. And then for the second term, we have um, our c over 2m is a all a constant. So we just have uh, c over 2m times 1 over 3t cubed um, minus um, c over 2m times 1 third, ti or 1 third 0 squared. But the second, that subtracted bit is just 0. So we have a ct cubed over 6m giving us our equation for, uh, for position given any time is just the initial position plus the initial velocity times time plus ct cubed over 6m. Now, since we know that um, when this 
expression is evaluated at t equals t1 and x not just equaling to 0 um, because we know that it stops at t1 um, 6 point or 4.68 seconds because that's what we found from part A. And then we're letting x not just equal 0 because we're just going to assume that the starting point is just 0 meters away or is just 0 meters because it's too much work to just to make the starting point somewhere else because um, you just have to do extra math if you're going to make the starting point anything other than 0. You might as well. So x of t1 is going to just be plugging into this equation and we have 29.2 meters per second. Once again, we're using the converted one rather than kilometers per hour. Times our time, which is 4.68 seconds, minus our C, which is 3360 3, 3, newtons per second, times the time cubed, which is 4, uh, yeah, 4.68 seconds cubed, over 6 times 1,260 kilograms, which when you do the math, gives you 91.1 meters. So, in the time that it took the car to break, um, so what we know is that this car, it's a it's about a ton, right? A metric ton. Uh, it took it 4.68 seconds to stop, and um, it had traveled a whole 91 meters by the time it had actually finally slowed to a stop which is quite a long way, so you probably wanted to maybe apply force a bit faster. Although, that's not what the question is asking for. That's just a bit of analysis on my part. And that's pretty much it for this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video, maybe. Or you might see the other guy. So enjoy yourselves, and um, one of us will be there for the next video, and uh, just keep doing physics.